Okay, so it's the um, so we are on the con yeah CRAD. So we're, we are on the conference call line the one six zero five seven eight one zero zero five that you should have gotten an uh, email announcement. Okay, so what I'd like to without going much into open source ecology, uh, assuming that. <laughs> We know enough what's going on. I'd like to bring up the, the latest, uh, some of the latest progress. And some of the main things that are happening, happening within the organization are, I mean, if, if you look at us starting, you know, when I started the project, maybe like in 2000, you know, the first level village construction set machine or the concept itself has been coined in TNA. And we're going along uh, in this process of open sourcing different things with the different prototypes of the tractor brick press power units and other things. But to date, I mean, the viral application has not happened so much. I mean, there there are altogether 27 different replications around the world, 12 of the brick press itself. But as far as the viral uptake of this around the world, I mean, that, that kind of thing is not happening. And uh, we're asking ourselves, how do we how do we make the blueprints, everything accessible, how we get them in general? One route that we're taking up uh, in a significant way right now is uh, pretty much working with existing open source projects on the areas of common ground. Because the 50 different projects include just about anything from agriculture construction to production to transportation, natural resources, um, just about anything that the physical environment is built of. And surrounding that are products and services that touch on just about any area. So a, a useful thing to do yeah, is... <laughs> yeah, Jonathan, are you, uh, Jonathan, you can hear us? Hello. Okay, Jonathan's having, <laughs> I don't know what Jonathan is, it sounds like Jonathan is having issues. So, um, I don't understand, I can't hear nobody. Okay, um, so continuing, so, with, I'm um, distracting. Uh, so, with respect to the, the recent work, we are reaching out to a lot of different organizations that are within the um, open source community already who are familiar with the culture, who have different projects that are already going along the same lines as open source ecology. So for example, if somebody is doing something that we are working on within the set and somebody else is doing that already in a similar way according to similar open source principles, then of course it's wise to join forces with them as opposed to uh, reinvent the wheel, which is the issue, exactly the issue that we're trying to solve. So a lot of uh, our current efforts revolves around finding those types of projects, and, and you'd be amazed what's out there. And I'll name a few today to, to, as far as what what contacts we are making. So first of all, I'll start with the, the very active projects that do exist within, within um, that is, uh, we just began work on the prototype two of the micro tractor, which means that the power cube, which is rather stable in its release, and we're adding tracks to that to make it a Toro Dingo like open source micro tractor. Uh, if you look up Toro Dingo, um, that is the machine that we're trying to, the best model of what, what is similar to, to what we're trying to do right now. Um, so that's, that's the micro track project. The, the other very active project is the open source aquaponics, which is uh, a greenhouse that features open source aquaponics plus mushrooms. There's going to be, so there's fish, mushrooms, naturally plants, sprouts, a nursery area, chickens, warm production for feed, uh, a, a hugely diversified and integrated operation that uh, we're trying to open source because food is a very common common denominator for many, many people That's a, that can lend itself to, to large parallel collaborations. So another project that we're taking, well, the brick press is something that we've built several houses with. We're trying to uh, get that off the ground as far as, well, the final level of, of uh, documentation because that's part of this project that we have along. Along those lines, currently on a brick press, we're looking for some people in the free CAD community, which is the open source CAD package. We're looking for people to, to help us convert everything that we have currently, which is a, actually a Libre CAD. We have step files for that, but we're trying to convert that so so that anyone has access to that in open source software. And looking into FreeCAD recently, there's a lot of developments on that, which allows us to use FreeCAD in a full in a full way. That the functionality is there. 
that's one of the collaborations we're we're getting into. So um, that's some of the uh, the main projects right now. Aqua, there's aquaponics. There's the micro tractor. Uh, we also have another active I which means we're develop, developing what's known as open source technology pattern language icons, which are uh, pretty much icons that represent parts, components, and different parts of the Global Village construction set so that we can use them uh, wh whenever we're doing either design work or just communications work. So that, that group is growing well. Um, that's moving forward. So some, some other collaborations. The, I'll go through the list that's in a, it's actually on the if you go to the True Fans page, True Fans Hangouts, uh, the April 2015, uh, there's some notes on that. Um, I'm going to paste that into the into the Pirate Pad for people to take a look at. If you guys are looking at the Pirate Pad, so um, so Caruza collaboration. So there's an open source project out there called Caruza, which is a wireless optical link. Uh, it's a Shuttle, Shuttleworth fellow. Uh, who's running that, but with they are actually working very well on a CNC torch table. Um, they have a design that totally meets our specs, and so pretty much we're, we're just collaborating with them. And in, on that project, they're pretty much going full force with it. We're, we're planning on replicating that here in about one month. Uh, if you look at the... Um, uh, I have the screencast, the screen capture here, but on, a, on the Facebook, I just published that pretty recently to paste that into the um, into the pirate pad. I just did that. Um, it's an excellent example of collaboration where we pretty much don't have to do anything. I mean, we, we've done a prototype of the CNC torch table before, but now we're going to build on on top of the Cruza work, where their design is is extremely simple. It's actually designed to be so simple that you can do it with a drill press. Not, not even a drill press, a manual drill and a grinder. So you can be uh, off-shelf parts, but are actually going to deploy that in, a, in, a, in Africa. But we're going to we use that for ourselves. And it's turning out that they're, they're getting data, performance data on it, and it's looking really good for us. It will be a CNC plasma cutter implementation. So with the same group, um, with uh, Luca Mustafa, uh, who's the the guy who's doing that. Uh, we're also working on a 3D printer. So, so our, our work on a 3D printer means that we build upon the RepRap project. So the guys from Caruza have perhaps, well, they have a, quite a decent 3D printer implementation. It's called Troublemaker. It's actually a, similar to um, basically the Ultimaker. It's essentially an Ultimaker clone, but it's a closed, uh, basically uh, enclosed, 3D printer. We're choosing that simply because they're, they're really good at documenting it and they've got many, many hours of good performance on it. So we're looking at it as a, as a good quality prototyping machine. We've considered other things such as the Lulz bot, but the Lulz bot actually has a few parts that, I mean, they actually use some, um, like in the latest model, so the Lulz bot mini. They are using some parts that are um, pretty much custom fabricated, like meant, bent metal. And also uh, the thing that doesn't work for us on, um, on a Lozobot style printer is that the platform moves. We wanted a printer where the platform does not move because we like to print a lot of very tall columnar structures. Well, anyway, technical details, but we're going for technical reasons. We're going with the, the Ultimaker style clone and we'd like to do workshops on that. Workshops meaning that we, we host weekend workshops where you can build that over a weekend. We train you, and it'll be a revenue generation model for um, for supporting some of our work and getting more people on board. Because one of the things we get people on with permanently, there needs to be some revenue coming in so that people can stay and work with us as opposed to volunteer and then disappear after some time because you know people have to work for a living. So we're trying to build in the economics with that. And a 3D printer is a decent way to do that, especially because we need the 3D printer for some prototyping work. Recently, I prototyped the trailer. Um, the trailer, we're building a heavy-duty trailer, or like a 10-ton trailer uh, for hauling stuff like tractors or, or dirt and things like that. But we prototyped it on 3D printer. You can look Facebook. Well, actually, it's linked off Facebook on a, on a trailer work. But... Um, 
yeah, it's definitely very useful for prototyping. So we want to go with the printer. As far as the revenue comes comes in, the brick press is something we have produced to generate revenue, and we're publishing those plans openly so that anyone can do that, and you know, people can do that. But we're making it even simpler by by better quality documentation. But the goal there is. Um, Start producing the 3D printers, well, not the 3D printers, the brick presses in a replicable way, meaning that we set up production working with a local fab shop where we can give the design to them and they can um, they can build it for us that we can sell. So that's one way to do it. It's not the it's not the thing where we build it in-house. I mean, we can do that too, and we will do that. And also, especially through the workshop model where we create an education experience around a real build so that we can actually do both production and education at the same time at a revenue model that that actually works. So, okay, so that's the collaboration with the 3D printer uh, slash CNC torch table. Um, I'm very excited about the CNC torch table because actually the, the group we're working with has just made just several extremely nice simplifications in the way they approached it so that we can coming up in about a month. So next item. Uh, we've put our first official workshop on a schedule, which is the Miracle Orchard Workshop. Uh, it's basically about how to design and implement an orchard that's essentially beyond organic, uh, a highly polycultural, permacultural orchard, orchard model where the fellow that we're working with, we invited him to do the workshop. Um, we're, we're talking about starting, spawning the open source nursery. Because one of the things we're finding out for any work in agriculture or with plant outs or large scale plant outs or orchards is that the stock is expensive. So uh, in other words, you, you could easily end up paying like $40,000 per acre for all the plants you want to put to this polycultural orchard. Well, we can reduce that significantly if, if we know how to propagate plants on, on our own. So that instead of paying $10 or $20 for a tree, you can propagate it very easily at maybe a dollar a tree or so. So that's a big thing for us. We want to put that as part of a, the regular open source ecology platform because if we want to replicate our operations in the future, we're going to have to have access to machinery. We're going to have to, to have access to plants, to genetic stock that makes it highly replicable. And the other thing about um, the open source nursery is that we want to get more people involved in propagating and breeding plants because when you really look at in detail there's a lot of a lot of plants are just simply not adapted to particular regions and there's only a few few nurseries out there that do that i mean uh, big commercial nurseries there you know like in america you got a few really huge ones and, and then some more but it's it's like it's something that every city or every region should have and nurseries are our stuff from Stark Brothers. Turns out a lot of stuff there just doesn't really work well here. And so there's a real need of local adaptation that we hope the open source nursery will, will um, basically solve that in one swoop. Okay, so that's the open source nursery, Miracle Orchard. Look at our website, opensourceecology.org, under workshops, and you can see the workshop for the Miracle Orchard. It's a great event coming up. Now, um, part of the work for OSC right now is that because we the machines are good enough, we're getting back into agriculture. And part of that is using the, the heavy machinery on our own land to do erosion control work, key line plowing, and other things. So uh, that starts with getting a site plan. So we're currently working, have initial contacts with the open source geo, OS geo, which is open source GIS. So we're inviting a person here to do a workshop on how you use open source GIS tools to generate a site plan. Also things like getting aerial maps, open source aerial maps with drones. How do you uh, get, um, get this whole process of design, planning, monitoring, internet of things, data acquisition into geographical information systems, that's GIS, for making the process of planning and documenting your agriculture much easier. So for example, for us, if we have a massive plant out of all kinds of plants and we're interested in selecting and breeding plants or just growing out orchards, that design can be communicated through 
the internet through cloud co collaborative platforms, which means that um, people can now get much more involved in the design process and, and can help us when they can edit these some of these documents or even maps online. Like say we want to come up with a design for our orchard, well, we can have a big crowd collaboration. We have the tools where we can communicate on the 3D uh, or the 2D or basically geospatial analysis can be done. Now, the interesting part for that is, is that the tools out there are pretty much available, but a lot of people know them or use them because GIS is still, that's a little bit up, up in terms of difficulty than using Facebook or email. It's, um, it's a little more skill, but we're trying to really open source that so it's highly accessible to anybody. And, and starting with ourselves, how do we use that to generate a site plan and do a massive plant out for next year where we're getting serious about agriculture. So we're talking about broad scale, about 20 acres of polycultural plant outs, orchards, nut trees, all kinds of useful crops for full food and fiber producing infrastructure, um, animals um, as well. So that's looking good. That's that's in progress. We've had initial contact with the people doing that workshop. So within a couple of weeks, that should be on the calendar for an exciting workshop on open source GIS. And a lot of people I know in, open, in the permaculture community, they are looking for that. I've heard a lot of conversations where, oh yeah, you got to get yourself a site plan, but it's going to cost you, you know, ten thousand dollars to get a professional to do that or whatever. Or or the surveys can be very expensive. So we're going to facilitate that with open tools and get those techniques, not only for how you document it, but also the, all the processes. How do you do your soil soil test? And how do you analyze your land? Uh, it basically mix the GIS field with the open source uh, permaculture, design, landscape, regeneration, all that kind of stuff, mixing that and, and learning from best practices. Okay, so next topic, FreeCAD. So, so right now we're in, con in contact with some of the, 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 their core developers, and online you can look at a recent blog post where we see some recent developments on the architecture modules. There's other modules that have come into that. I've recently had a conversation with a person who does motion analysis that's interested in open sourcing that code and putting that into FreeCAD. So actually this is getting quite exciting. Humble FreeCAD, which is an open source fully extensible CAD platform, the beauty about it is that you can add just about anything to it that you want, including Cloud CAD. So those are those are things to look out for in the future. Uh, but FreeCAD is an open project, so it doesn't have a, I mean, it has a decent development community, but it's not like it has millions of dollars behind it in terms of development support. No, it doesn't. It's a free project, but the, some of the capacities within FreeCAD are getting really good and for that reason is where we, we want to transition to FreeCAD as our official platform, like, for example, do the brick press and any other tools because the a simple access issue, like right now, the, you know, when somebody did the, uh, the work in the Libre design on the, on the brick press, well, I can't work on it. Only the people that have that piece of software do end up working on it. So we cannot ever leverage that, that larger collaborative process if the software is not open. So there's a real practical case for why we do want that this open software so that anybody can collaborate. So really good news. I'm quite encouraged about FreeCAD. Uh, and I do want to talk. So Yorick is one of the people, their developers, who actually, believe it or not, uses FreeCAD for all of his, um, as far as I know, all of his design work as a professional architect. So the capacity is there. Now you have to be a little more savvy than using a tool like Revit, which is the proprietary variant of that for CAD, for for architecture CAD, but yeah, the tool, the capacity is getting out there. Uh, we're we're in contact with Yorick, and I'd like to ask him if he can actually begin on or help us with like when we're doing aquaponics greenhouse. That's another one of our projects. Um, the structure for that and the other modular CEB construction techniques that we're doing. Can we actually start using? Uh, FreeCAD for that, the architecture module there. So very exciting. Okay, next item would be um, OSC chapters. So so there's uh, we've been talking about chapters for a long time, and basically there's a bunch of chapters that started independently without really any kind of like like in the wild you can say. But we're trying to get serious about directing chapters to 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 be very essential contributors to the core development of OSC. 
So we're developing those standards. We're actually planning on, we'd like to have a meeting for the first time next month sometime with some of the people who are piping up through the internet uh, in different countries who are interested in starting a chapter. And we're thinking about first, the, the first step to that is you become an OSC ambassador, which means somebody who gets really familiar with all the uh, our development techniques, our latest status, where we are, maybe join some working teams, design sprints, and be a good representative. Someone's asks you, well, what's OSC doing that you're, you know, as an ambassador, you, you know very well what are the current projects, how to collaborate. You have some experience in actually uh, participating in a project so you, you can know what to expect culturally and, and work-wise and all that. So, so that's the first step. And after that, we, um, so, so there's the, the part about um, ambassadorship with ambassadorship comes training. Like the one thing that we haven't done much at OSC to date is give specific attention to how we train people to in the techniques that OSC uses. So a lot of times it's been pretty much you just dive right in and do what you can. And some people who are savvy in different tools, they can collaborate right away. But it, it seems like a lot of people are also left out because they might not have the tools. So they like to focus more on on educating people with various skills. And that includes both the technical skills and leadership skills. So one thing that's a huge gap for the project right now is our leadership. I mean, we don't have enough project leaders. We have our community manager, Jonathan. Um, we've got graphics lead, power cube lead. I'm doing a lot of the technical development. But basically what we need to do is, is have people that rise to the leadership effort of of, of being known as the, as the project lead for, for all the different projects that we have. And that means also get familiar with some, some management techniques, just like how do you run effective meetings, how do we document, how do we um, do the various things that make us have the capacity to execute so that people come back and have productive meetings and continue the development in a meaningful way. So um, there's going to be more info on the OSC chapter, so I know that some of you on the Hangout right now are interested in that. Uh, but we can talk more about that. So uh, chapters we'd like to see evolve to, to solid contributors where we have monthly meetings and pretty much keep up on the progress. It would be nice if the chapters, each chapter took on, pretty much beca became the kind of like owner of one of the machines so that we have continuous development and and a solid effort and, and we know um, that the effort is, is moving us forward to the Global Village construction set. Because one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that um, the beauty of the set is as the set. You know, one of the machines can get you only so much, only when you have the full ecology of machines that can actually build other machines and interact with one another like a Lego set, the full power of that is seen for applications such as the flexible fabrication shop or, or just the integrated capacity to, to start up any kind of productive enterprise. But a lot of times, um, I mean, really, Think that everybody needs to get themselves an economy. Well, here are the tools to do it. And you'll find that, okay, well, you, you don't just need one. You need a whole set. Uh, and the beauty of the, the GVCS is that, is that it's supposed to give us that full set. But um, the point is that you have to have that whole set. Like, for example, going as deep as melting metal and, you know, rolling your own steel from scrap stock or providing your own energy or... Um, just, just the whole tool chain of, of how of what's needed to to run a community or an enterprise of any sort. So the beauty is in the whole set. There's a lot of interactions between the different tools, and we don't really know how the entire set looks until all the tools are bit, built. And then we see, okay, how do they interact? Now, what do we have to change? What's missing? See, we can't tell that all right now until it's all built. So we can debate a lot. Okay, well, what's good right now? But the real answers are going to come once at least one prototype exists for every single machine. And right now we have about there's about 18 or 17 or so prototypes that we have built for the first time. There's uh, but none of them of the 17. I mean, there's four that are pretty much ready for release. But uh, there's many, much more work. That's why you want to get the chapters going. Now, okay, so here's a nice little treat that um, I want to talk about for next year. Um, for next, uh, not this year, but August of 2016, uh, we're going to invite 50 to 100 people here basically for a big, massive build-out. So it's going to be a massive 
massive prototyping event at factory farm that we're going to prepare seriously for until until then to build out many machines with the various contributors that are already contributing to the project and pretty much 50 to 100 people massive build out for the entire month of august 2016. so for that uh, we're going to invite people who are already working on various projects who are with us to basically we in a nutshell we'd like to build one half a civilization <laughs> within that month so that's the general um, kind of program, but we are looking at that as an epic program such that when we test, when we develop, um, or as we develop right now with the various ways of building teams, building our prototyping capacity, building our video making capacity, the graphics icons, all these other things, um, the fruit of it is when these techniques all work together for rapid development where we can build a lot of different things using similar methods so that the build can be extremely rapid. Well, that's the goal for this massive all-out build event of August 1 through 30 of 2016. So that's over a year from now, but we're already thinking about that. Okay. So other um, collaborator news, Oldsbot is, um, is an open source 3D printer company that's doing a lot of great work in terms of their really hardcore open source hardware company. They're growing like crazy. Uh, they're still taking over the world. They just got featured in, in Forbes magazine, and they are on um, uh, how it's made on the Science Channel. They just got on there. But uh, we'd like to report on that because it's a great example. Of, like, for example, on the Science Channel, how it's made, well, because they're an open source company is why they're, uh, as far as I know, that's why the Science Channel is able to make a piece about them because they have a transparent open process where they build a lot of the, the machines, their 3D printers in-house. So it's a great showcase for showing that transparency of the production process, which would just not be possible for other 3D printer makers if they're proprietary or closed about what they do or don't, don't really let you into their shop or outsource everything through sweatshops or whatever. So um, no, great, great job on Lulzbot. Congratulations to them. You can look at recent Facebook posts that I just posted. That's just recent news from today. They just got into Forbes. Add the people who are going to create the future of you. Just high creativity, high innovation, uh, spirit of ingenuity. Excellent stuff. So um, that, that's a, uh, just about everything on the collaborations as far as what we're doing in-house. So I mentioned the micro track. Uh, the new version that's going to be similar to a Toro Dingo, basically taking a power cube, the existing power cube with a structural frame, and pretty much adding tracks to it and adding a loader so you can have an infinite number of elements for that. Uh, the Aquaponics Greenhouse Working Team that I mentioned, we'd like to develop the uh, our techniques to invite a much greater bit of participation on that from the crowd. So, so the way this open source consortium, let me just talk a little bit about that. Um, we're framing it in within somewhat of an open source consortium in the sense that we have a core team of people, four or five, that are developing this. And you can see a recent, on Facebook and see a recent update about that. But we're doing um, pretty much designing the thing going forward. But uh, our next step on that is to define a process where, uh, well, first of all, break down the project into many, many parts. So, so the key to our success or development velocity would be that um, for anything that we do, just as a background for OSC, we, we like to do module-based design where we break down the project into as small parts as possible to make that feasible in terms of development or make it crowdsourceable because then many people can follow a similar process to develop many, many parts in parallel for a, a single machine. So if you break a machine into modules or anything, like a house or the greenhouse, into modules, then people can develop in parallel on the individual modules using similar techniques. This lends itself uh, to, well, the, the let's say the greenhouse, the aquaponics green, greenhouse lends itself very highly to this kind of process. In the greenhouse, we have a whole array of crops, about 40, 50 of them. We need complete details on how to, how to grow them, what their yields are, what are the tricks to doing it properly, how, you know, what kind of system do you use, do you use like a tower system, do you use a floating raft, do you use soil, do you use gravel medium? There's many ways to do it in aquaponics. Um, but for because there's so many different pieces, we'd like to get a crowd process defined for how you can do that in parallel. Now, a good example of motivation for this, how this can work, is our iconography group, 
where we've defined procedures for how people can learn Inkscape and create icons according to our standards. And last week, we produced 50 of those icons. And mo actually, most of those icons were produced by people who have not attended that design sprint meeting. So because we had the procedures defined, people can actually act on them and make very meaningful work for open source technology. So that's, that's what we'd like to see um, in the future as the project grows, essentially develop all these techniques that people can independently start developing things that are very useful for others. So that means documentation and various processes for making it all happen. It's a whole complex tool chain uh, using simple tools, but there's, there's a whole ecological process, um, kind of a complex system process in there to make that happen actually properly because there's a lot of moving parts. So that's an example. We'd like to do that, that kind of process, uh, a, a parallel development process and on the aquaponics greenhouse because there's so many crops in there. Okay. Um, Let's see, I mentioned also leadership development. Leadership is, if we talk about different projects running in parallel, we simply need more leadership coming from the community besides so the team leaders that are there already. Uh, so we invite people to, to talk to us about that and become ambassadors and become project leaders. Uh, you can see the wiki page, uh, it's called Working Teams on the wiki, what currently exists as far as working teams. And, uh, yeah, that's a big, big bottleneck for the project in terms of having more people, more, more project leaders working in parallel with us, which could also lend itself to, to chapters becoming such parallel developers. Okay, um, the CEB press, um, that's still, uh, just to review that, we're looking for somebody who can use FreeCAD to redo the machine in FreeCAD, but that process starts with creating a tutorial uh, so before we actually do that in FreeCAD, I'd like to see a tutorial come out with which we can teach others how to do that in FreeCAD. So step number one is document how we would use FreeCAD, and that way you can have more people join that process um, as we move forward so that there is not the bottleneck of just, okay, this one person is our FreeCAD leader and nobody else can, can do it. Well, we got to focus all the time on training people up to do the various tasks that we need to do. So, hey, um, that's about all the news or kind of main things I'd like to talk about, but maybe we can now uh, transition to the second part, which is question and answer and, and any discussions that we'd like to entertain. I'm going to cut the video recording here. Um, that's good. And still I'm doing the screencast of all the, all the material that we're talking about here. Um, okay, so any questions? Anybody would like to pipe in? Andrea, um, can you hear? Yeah, hello, hello, Martin. So you are, yeah, Andrea. So you're you're from um, you're from France, or where are you from? Yeah, I'm it, I'm Italian. I live in France, and uh, ah. we I'm following uh, open source ecology since a few years now. Uh, participated a little with uh, with something, and since. Uh, uh, recently, I'm a true friend. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so yeah. I, um, I was, uh, I was pushing a little uh, uh, my friends around in France uh, to mm -hmm. to start the open source ecology uh, global village construction set development here, and uh, mm -hmm. we finally really take off, uh, I believe. Uh, we are uh, we, we are running quite fast on the on the solar concentrator. Uh, yeah. 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 What's the latest latest progress on that? Uh, do you have a link that you can share or? Yeah, sure. Um, we have uh, we are running right now a design sprint. Uh, mm -hmm. We are about to, to end it uh, uh, mid of May. And um, we mm -hmm. currently we currently develop the the design uh, with Inventor, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we are going mm -hmm. to to transfer all of this design into FreeCAD. So this okay. was already in the plan before to share it uh, with the community. We thought to share it through 
GitHub. GitHub, yeah. So it's easy, so it's easy also for the versioning. And, um, yeah. and the, currently in May, we are going to build uh, a, a very small model, a table model, um, so 50 by 50 centimeters of uh, our uh, uh, linear Fresnel reflector uh, solar concentrator. Yeah, excellent. Have you guys done any thinking on what it would look like for the heat engine that's required to run the solar concentrator? You mean or, uh, for, for uh, electricity production? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are thinking about uh, a Stirling engine, but uh, mm -hmm. we are not there yet. We are not there yet. Yeah. We, we think... We think we will get an output uh, of about 250 to 300 degrees. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, before to come... Yeah, indeed, sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I said we, ha we will have a little bit of troubles with the conversion. But yeah, um, yeah 300, 250 degrees Celsius and... Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, initially, <clears throat> our goal, uh, and uh, we are uh, well uh, uh, in line with our objective, is uh, to present a small scale uh, solar concentrator by the end of September 2015, uh, which is a, a, a four square meters uh, of. How many? Four, four square meters. Yeah. Four square meters. Okay. About, yeah, we think about it will produce uh, a little bit under one kilowatt uh, uh, output of power of thermal power. Mhm. Mm okay. And and we are going to present this uh, in a in a big event uh, in Paris. Uh, um, which is uh, organized by a movement called Alternativa. Uh, uh -huh. we, we, think, we think there will be about 50,000 people around in, in, uh, in Paris for that uh, weekend. Excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts? So regarding the team that you have uh, for open source ecology efforts in France, uh, how many people are actively participating there? So we are. Uh, um, we um, we started. We started really taking off uh, in uh, October like last year, and mm -hmm. uh, currently we are uh, actively. We have uh, between uh, ten to fifteen people who contribute uh, at mm -hmm. a different level uh, with the project. And, uh, but we are expanding fast. So at each session, we meet new people who are interested, who bring, who bring a little break uh, of contribution, and uh, some mm -hmm. of them, they start to, to, to get involved. So there is, there yeah. is a good uh, movement uh, uh, moment uh, that... Uh, yeah. Moment, uh, that is growing up. So we are quite positive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. So um, what are your thoughts on the, the actual standards, the, the chapters and, and standards? So we, we, what we would like to do is, is have a, be like a first meeting with the different people who are who have contacted us about OSE chapters. We'd like to host one next month, so sometime in May where we pretty much start talking about what, what the needs are and, and you know, how can we collaborate more, more effectively. I like it that you guys are selecting the projects and that you're going forward because we'd like to do, have that uh, happen for, that each chapter kind of takes on, owns like one of the projects so that we can, for example, if somebody you know, contacts me about the solar concentrator and refer them to you guys, and what we should do is, Potentially, um, when we when we do the design sprints, I mean, we should talk about how we collaborate and, and advertising them, or like building. You know, what do you need to to make your project go better? 
you know, how, what are some of the needs that you have? I mean, so we want to discuss some of those things in the next month's meeting with, with all the different chapters so we get a good idea of, of what OSC can provide and, and how the different chapters feel um, that, the best things they can provide to OSC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I believe that uh, that's very good. And uh, yeah, let, let's start organizing up. I've seen also some movement in Italy, in Spain, in Germany. Yeah. I'm in contact with uh, Gregory, with uh, um, Nikolai as well, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, a few others from Spain. Uh, yeah. yeah, some group didn't or made something and then slowed down a little bit. Uh, I, I can see that. Mm -hmm. We are very well motivated, and we know, we understand uh, that the, glo the global village construction set is a, a revolutionary tool set uh, that uh, can yeah. can can improve actually uh, the transition uh, toward an open hardware uh, civilization. Yeah, so big, yeah, that would probably then. Yeah, that's. That would be nice. So yeah, that sounds good. Um, so, so yeah, next cool. month uh, will it be an hangout as well? Uh, How, sorry, say that again. Will it be on uh, on internet as well? I believe. Yeah, yeah, we want to do that. Probably something like a Google Hangout or something like that. Are you in touch? Because I know the Italy people have built, I mean, they were looking at building the, the brick press as a business. Do you know what happened to that effort? Yeah, they they did build the, the brick press. They converted uh, to metric uh, uh, to metric measurement. But then uh -huh. the, trouble, the trouble was with the legislation. So the bricks mm -hmm. uh, they built, it, they were not actually authorized to do something uh, that was useful. Uh, so this is uh, more or less uh, how the story was. But uh, I tried to get uh, in touch with them, uh, but I didn't have any any answer for now. I will try again. Yeah. So it sounds like legal troubles have have made it. Maybe they got discouraged because okay, you might have all these certifications or regulations that they would have to apply for up front, which might have discouraged them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I read uh, some, on some forum of them, uh, I read uh, this kind of yeah. issue. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting... Uh, in America, there is not really... It uh, doesn't appear to be the, the kind of legal restrictions like in Europe. Um, but also, yeah. Also, for the for the tractor, you, you don't have any, uh -huh. any legal requirement for the tractor. So for for us, if it's if it's agriculture and machinery, I mean there are standards for safety that we would have to adhere to. But I mean, there's not. I mean, there's no. I know that that governs what you can and cannot produce in this country. I mean, I don't know if anyone else has insights on that. But I mean, if you if you manufacture something, um, you're free to to manufacture what you what you like. Typically, I mean, typically the requirements are liability insurance for for liability issues, but there's different ways to go about it. I know that custom fabricators, I mean, custom fabricators don't have any specific, as far as I know, they don't have any specific contract or any kind of uh, license that they need from any governing body here. Um, I haven't seen that. So... Well, I think it depends. Yeah. Uh, tell us more. I think it depends uh, on your locality. For example, in the state yeah. of Texas, you may yeah. be, uh, do pretty much anything you want on your own land, but the moment it off your land, is the uh, regulatory effects come into play. So, for example, so for example the tra trailer. You take the trailer off the mm -hmm. property at that point, it has to be licensed. Right, right. Yeah, naturally, naturally. So, so there's things like if it's a vehicle on a road. Yeah, I mean, you you would need a license for vehicles. But things like tractors. 
I'm not aware of um, any laws. Like, for example, if we produce a tractor, I mean, we can use that anywhere. Is that not so? Or Again, it depends on locality. In some localities, mm -hmm. tractors, uh, agricultural equipment has a, a much less, a much lower barrier mm -hmm. to use than does, uh, than mm -hmm. does a car. Mm -hmm. But the reality right. is it, it will depend from locality to the locality. Yeah. You definitely get into into issues of local uh, locality here and where we are in an agricultural zone. We don't have we don't run into those issues. But it's something we want to document fully as we go forward for what exactly those restrictions might be, and that will depend on a machine. Like um, you know, for example, if you you know, like when people build build a three D printer or you build your own or something like that. Um, I'm not sure there's, I haven't heard of restrictions, say, for 3D printers if you build it. Um, so can you guys hear me? If it comes, so? if it comes in yep. kit form and you build it, it's a lot mm -hmm. easier, less restrictions. But if you sell oh. it, then there's a, then there's obviously an issue at that point of liability. So how how does it work for, you know, say, you know, say we're selling like 3D printers. I mean, what's, what exists in the U.S. that you have to comply with? Like, okay, so say you, you start producing 3D printers, you sell them on eBay, you know, what do you have to have? Well, you normally, you don't have to comply with anything until somebody really comes after you. Um, but for mm -hmm. example, in California, you have uh, the labeling that has to do with, uh, for example, uh, lead and things like that. If the con if mm -hmm. the product contains lead, you have to label it in a specific way. Right. Um, it really, you know, it just depends on what you, however you are selling a kit, that's mm -hmm. different. Um, right. At that point, it's the onus of the builder to ensure that it is uh, with any rules and regulations. And first, let me qualify. I have a lawyer. I have just a bit of experience with these things. You you have you have or I have I've been involved in a few builds of other. So what experience? Uh, been? I'm sorry. Sorry. What 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 has your experience been with this? You said you have you do have some experience with this. Well, for example, if you build, uh, I've worked on kit airplanes. I've worked on mm -hmm. uh, drones. I've worked on. Mm -hmm. uh, I started to build. Um, you know. All a, a few startups that develop hardware, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know you you get to what really affects you is when you you alluded to going viral in the conversation. Mm -hmm. You go mm -hmm. viral, and all of this stuff. I stop and say, well, wait a second. Um, have they done this? Has it been evaluated for that? What kind of mm -hmm. uh, performance? What kind of performance? Mm -hmm. Profile does it have it? When you get success, right. that's when you're there. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh huh. You're the you're doing a hydroponics experiment right now. Uh, no, sorry, I was uh, to you about the tractor. Sorry, um, no, I understand. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm missing who, who, what's your name? Dave Fuller, Dave Fuller. I just okay, called Dave. yesterday. Okay, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I did not mean to derail. Please proceed. No, no, no. Uh, there was an, I, I thought you were this other guy who actually contacted me recently about the, um, the aquaponics. So... Paul Van yeah, that might have been me. I'm Paul Vandenbush. Okay, okay. Yeah, Paul. Okay. Uh, I thought, okay, I got the names crossed up. Yeah, so, but tell us, um, so maybe like on the previous, um, the previous kind things on So, um, David, uh, so you've built things like, um, What's your experience in specifically, so we can learn from that? Well, like, like I said, I've built from kits before, and you know, kit airplanes, from, kit airplanes, kit cars, things like that. And mm -hmm. generally, you know, if 
there's a, a it, or some uh, that that really isn't going to come into play until you hit what you were talking about earlier the the viral yeah. status. And actually, right. that was a question that I I had wanted to bring up, which was, yep. you know, have you considered, you know, packaging, working with, you know, some metal suppliers to build kits? I mean, that can help propagate things very quickly. Because are you saying that from the perspective of the liability or from the perspective of people building simply? Well, from the perspective of people building, which once you're successful with that, then you'll have to start dealing with the liability. Right. We we are currently considering on a brick press. So there's Swagger Shop, the local manufacturer, the local custom fab guy. Uh, he's perfectly capable of doing that. He's got a CNC torch table as well. But, but yeah, we definitely want to bring that about. So that's one of the things we'd like to see up and running uh, by the end of this year. Uh, we're kind of getting distracted with a lot of these other things. Um, so we kind of put the brick press not on priority until we get the basically the workshop schedule set up for this year. But it would be great to, I mean, what what our thought on, for example, the brick press, which is pretty much the final state of of development, with yes, publish the information of how to do that from how to have others build our kits. So we do that. We work with some fabricators around us. We can work with Swagger Shop and others, but also uh, publish how others can get into that for the concept of the viral replication. If we are truly open about the technology, then we want others to, we, we just publish all our details about that because we think this can help many people. So that's something we definitely want to want to get out there and would be a good idea because that would uh, allow a whole other segment of people, custom fabricators or other guys to get involved. And that has, a, I mean, if documented properly, there's a chance to spread far and wide. So that is definitely a good idea. Yeah. Uh, Martin, um, I, it wasn't clear. I, I thought I saw that you sold some of the tractor that you built, right? Seven or this was um, basically to, in a form of pretty much people who you can say got the kit from us. So we've sold some of the kits ourselves before. The We've also done a workshop where the person who builds, who actually gets the machine, participates in a workshop, so they're like the own owner builder. And now we're trying to get into the simple aspect of, okay, let's just get a fabricator to build it for us. So there's all these different ways that we can we can work on getting the machines out there. And then we use them for our own purposes as well. So it can have different ways that this disseminates it. I think the biggest power will be when other entrepreneurs or fabricators, custom fabricators, anybody, so, so when we publish enough information that that becomes an easy process for others. Now at the point, I mean, we, I mean, because we don't have so much of this out there yet, typically the replications that have happened were when I talk about 27 replications altogether. All of that has been by independent individuals. So uh, nobody has taken on to actual production of machines yet. But I do suspect that, yeah, I mean, naturally, as if the, the things do succeed, then you're going to get into the whole new area of legal issues that, that we're going to have to have good legal advice and support in that whole process so we negotiate those barriers effectively. So that's going to be a, another whole other game. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, here in yeah. France, uh, in order to avoid, to, to limit uh, the legal aspect, uh, uh, we thought to, uh, we actually organized uh, the open source ecology effort uh, uh, as a, an association. So we are uh -huh. all, uh, volunteers working for uh, on the on the research and development <clears throat> and we uh -huh. will, we would like to limit the association uh, to the research and development 
So we we will mm-hmm. bring uh, the development up to the pro- to the second prototype. So uh, an advanced yeah. level uh, of uh, of the machine, and mm-hmm. and then we will encourage uh, probably some uh, of our uh, uh, team who already mm-hmm. earn the the know-how. Uh, to to build a cooperative to push for uh, for the machine uh, so to bring it to market and to offer yes. all the services that goes with it so uh, kit uh, provisioning or uh, assembling mm-hmm. or uh, after mm-hmm. sales warranty on site uh, maintenance and so on yeah and and so right. so like th- like this, we sep- we think to separate the the legal the different legal aspect of that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Now for us, I mean, okay, so if we go the route we're working with Swagger Shop, we simply have them do the production. Then is that then the the liability pretty much upon them, as far as um, the liability the product liability issue. Um, then, then effectively, it appears that that would be their, their responsibility. Now, I don't know. I don't know the details. Any insights on that from the other people? My my thought is that maybe what we should maybe what you should do is contact the Free Software Foundation and uh-huh. get one of their lawyers uh, to you know kind of guidance on product liability. You know, it's yeah. not software. It's not software. It's hardware. Yeah. It's right. fancy touch, you know. But I, I don't see why they wouldn't be able to give you that. I mean, you, I mean, this is a legitimate project, and it's been around for a long time, and it's produced results. So why wouldn't mm-hmm. they give you that time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's we, we have to uh, simply do that, just reach out to the people. And interestingly... Someone from Caterpillar recently has volunteered to to help us, which mainly brought up the question of legal liability for them sharing trade secrets. So we actually have a volunteer lawyer working the situation out for us in terms of determining exactly what this person can and cannot do. So yeah, definitely. But yeah, the legal issues are something to document fully and work out as we go forward. We just have simply haven't done that, but that's something we need to pursue aggressively at some point if we if we get to the point where uh, this stuff is starting to really roll out production lines everywhere, yeah. So, well, definitely. I think that you know, I I don't I don't mean to derail, you know, or or divert, yeah. you know, this is my first meeting. Um, yeah. You know, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. You know, how does mm-hmm. how does it propagate? How does it get out there? Because um, as I yeah. alluded to in one of my emails to you, this is actually something similar that I was thinking about uh, because recently wrote with roles. So how does it get out there? How does it become successful? You know, that you've got early adopters like I. There's probably not a lot of people here who aren't earlers. But how do you get it to the main sh- right on that where you know uh in the rural communities, you know there's four h clubs there's auto shops there's all sorts of things and if you have a kit you know something uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, yeah, you mentioned some thoughts about how this can happen, but where where would you see ideally that, I mean, in an ideal world, have you thought what it would look like in an ideal situation? I'm sorry, repeat that, you broke up. Yeah, no, I mean, what are your thoughts on, what do you think is an ideal situation for how this could spread out if everything went well? Well, I mean, the... You know, let, let's take the tractor. You know, uh-huh. my, one of the reasons why I'm interested in the tractor is, is I told you that, you know, I'm mm-hmm. producing some land. But the other, the other interest is, my uncle has a really old tractor, 
and mm-hmm. that he can't run anymore. It's one of the old clutch ones, but yours is hydraulic. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, there's lots of farmers, there's lots of rural people who don't have 40000 for a new tractor. You know, they don't have right. $20,000 for a new tractor. But what they do have, you know, is a friend that has a metal shop, mm-hmm. you know, or a high school that is willing to, you know, take on a project mm-hmm. class. You know, they do that. They do that stuff yeah. all the time. And they have the 4 right. clubs, which are everywhere in rural America. You know, so right. I mean, taking one of taking one of the uh, one element from the construction set, kitting it, yeah. putting it into a kit form, associating with the appropriate educational materials with it. Not they don't even have to be mm-hmm. good ones, but just mm-hmm. enough to get mm-hmm. like. Uh, a high school auto shop or or metal shop started, you might see yeah. something then. Yeah, I mean that could be. So you see that. Um, so getting more specific on that to drill into that, I mean, I think that's a great way because there's all this talent. I mean, a lot of people just end up. I mean, I hear a lot about you know students restoring tractors left and right. You know, typical projects maybe for high school shop or. Is in high school or is that outside? Uh, I'm sorry, you broke up again. But I think okay. your question is: is yeah. that was is it just only in high school? Well, no, there's vocational yeah. schools too. Okay. So there's yeah, even um, prison. <laughs> no, I mean it's true. I mean, look, the the concept is that there's a lot of interest that can be had. Now the question is. Okay, what exactly would be the best way to approach it? I mean, if I mean, we definitely welcome if I mean, do you want to bring up this topic to I mean, do you know people around you or clubs like that around you that you can say, okay, we're working on this micro tractor. Is anybody interested? Um, I mean, well, yeah, I did have a. There's um, there's another aspect of this is that pretty much states like Texas and uh, I believe you're in Missouri, right? Yeah. yeah. They have their ag they they have their boards. Okay. Uh and each one of those ag boards uh will support various projects. Mm-hmm. So one of the things as as I told you about it that I was interested in was, you know, very much like your your I believe you called it an e factory. Um yeah, factory is a, right, a rural yeah, a rural maker factory. shop. Mhm. You know, because yeah. um the 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 main fabricators in America believe it or not are the custom fabricators. They're located rural in rural areas because they have to do it themselves. They have to fix their equipment. Yeah. You know, a uh, plow breaks. They've got to they've got to make a new plow. You know, so mm-hmm. it it's not unusual for farms to have, you know, lathes and drill presses and things like that. What they don't have is 3D yeah. printers, CAD, or anything like that. And what they don't mm-hmm. have are the plans to build a tractor. Right. So you could potentially one of the state uh, ag boards to actually work with you to establish Mm-hmm. you know, a rural maker shop. Yeah. And yeah. they'll handle the advertising. Uh, okay, so we'll give you a mm-hmm. lot of it. My face. Um, yeah. But they will they will take you around and, and introduce you to people and things like that because that's their job. Their job is to support well, the, the agricultural community. And I'm but just, is there a lot of special... So let me, I mean, the first question that pops up to my mind is, isn't there a lot of special interests that would not want to see this succeed, like John Deere and things like that? Yeah, I'm sure there are, but, you know. And how tight are the people in these places coupled to organizations like John Deere? Real tight, and some of them are real tight, and others are, you know, they do it not because they make a lot of money, because they don't. Um, they do it because they enjoy it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's just like yeah. you know, it's not going to. No, I mean, try and yeah, yeah. I think uh, so. On our side, we 
thought a lot, a lot of different avenues of how this can get out there. I think we're still, I mean, we may not even be there yet in terms of, I mean, for example, the press is really good and the power cube is very good. But, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to get people excited about those things in some way. If it's the power cube itself, what are you going to run with the power cube, right? So we simply, in many cases, haven't gotten to the point of, okay, we've got turnkey products ready for you. Now, here you go. I think it's going to happen much more with a micro tractor, like after this year, where if we have a, a decent micro tractor, that is something just about anybody can get get their you know get their mind around, and then translating that into a bigger tractor. That. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely worthwhile ideas. And part of it is that we're just simply not there for in a lot of the things, or you know, as far as having the the proven record of machines doing doing work in the field. I mean, we have to have more of that still to make it more credible. Like, for example, for the normal um, farmer guy, their, their discussion starts at like, you know, like 100 or 200 horsepower for a tractor. Ours have been 50, you know. So, so a lot of these guys aren't simply interested because of the size. If they're doing mainstream agriculture, they're at least, you know, like 150 horsepower or not. So, but that's something we can actually succeed quite a bit at once we get there. Um, and I'm hoping that it's this year with a bulldozer build. So we actually start well, going into into that area. That if you look back in time, uh, mm-hmm. you'll find that most tractors that when they first came out didn't have much more more horsepower than what you know is available in now in the in the power cube. Mm-hmm. Yep. So um, well, it's and it's fine for a small farm. And there are, right. it, not only is it fine for a small farm, it's fine, it's fine for the people who are wannabe farmers, not right. you know somebody who just wants to sustain themselves, which basically right. falls right squarely into your mission statement. Yep. Anyway. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I see that. Yeah, there's huge, I think the, the micro tractor itself can be a huge boon to all these organic agriculture people. It can be totally for the backyard gardener too. Um, I think for easing her burden and doing all the gardening work here and all that. So yeah, I think that can be a very significant hit, that significant milestone that we can have. Mm-hmm. Well, I monopolize the discussion, so I'm gonna go yeah. back and observe more. No. Okay. Um. Yeah. No, good comments. So, yeah, any other comments, any other questions from other people? Um, so, any in discussion yeah. from Paul? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering. It sounds like you're going to have uh, two different types of greenhouses. One is uh, sized for a family, and one is sized for uh, for-profit business. And um, I, I guess it's uh, kind of interesting to look at the two different approaches. Um, mm-hmm. And another question, I guess, are you looking at building the, the thing with uh, the brick-making machine and, and uh, the other machines that you've built? Is that part of the mm-hmm. concept? Yep, yep, okay. Uh, so the answer to both questions is yes and no. <laughs> so, okay, um, on the last question is easy to answer. That we are actually considering the stem wall to be brick, so that way we can actually showcase. Oh wow, we're using our brick press again, and it's got these good thermal properties and so forth. So yeah, we're looking forward to that. The second part mm-hmm. is the distinction between 800 square foot for a family versus a commercial unit. So the concept is that within the 800 square foot unit we will test out all the different components with the intent that what we designed for the 800 square foot be like. So the 800 square foot basically is going to be a proof of concept with high diversity, like really, really high diversity for, you know, for a family to get their food. And then we're going to pick the elements that we want to scale and select perhaps 50 or however many percent of that whole set for the, the production greenhouse. For the production greenhouse, we're considering both just a simple thing as you, as someone wants to produce for market, 
But more interesting for us is actually what we believe in is that part of community building, skill, skill getting, where it's a production slash education operation, meaning something like a CSA, community supported agriculture, where people sub have a subscription to that. But part of it would be that if it's in nearby, near a city, it would be where you actually train the people to do some growing and you train them to pick the stuff. So it's essentially like an open house CSA where people take at least some role in the production activity so that this accommodates, one, the food production, and two, that people are really getting, getting skilled and getting under, understanding of what it means to grow things. So mm -hmm. we're, try, we're very interested in the concept of New civilization from the standpoint that you can't have a new, you cannot have a new civilization with dumb people. <laughs> you gotta train the people who who are missing the practical hands-on skills. Uh, we want to definitely bring that in, keep that within the mission, very clear for whatever product we do. So mm -hmm. that's that's how we would apply it in the in the greenhouse. Yeah. Yeah. There's somebody uh, in Milwaukee that is that is doing something very similar. Um, I forget the name, but growing they power. are growing power. Yeah, they are basically their input is a lot of uh, composting material, um, food scraps, leaves, um, yeah. yep, yep. and that is that is where their input, their big input, is coming from. And they've actually um, mm -hmm. not had to heat their greenhouse, or at least yeah, that's what that's, they're saying. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a really great operation. It's huge input, huge output. Uh, we'd like to do one that's uh, what we would call perhaps much more documented and replicable. Um, mm -hmm. So we're focusing on really the clear documentation that would make it make it spread. Um, I don't know how we can work with them. I mean, we can definitely invite them to the Open Source Aquaponics Consortium if they want to be a member, w meaning that whatever they contribute to that is they understand that it's open source and crowdsourced and all that. So we could definitely reach out to them. That's not, that would actually not be a bad idea. Maybe someone from their organization would be interested in developing some of the crop production plans. We can certainly learn from them. They've got a bunch of experience on that. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's I like the, um, the replication idea. I think that uh, it's very important and very important for people to, to learn how to operate uh, aquaponics. Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. because yeah. aquaponics is relatively new, and yeah. um, almost everybody that knows something about aquaponics has been experimenting and learning mm -hmm. on their own, uh, reinventing yeah. the wheel in many cases. So, oh yes, um, absolutely. So about six years ago, I did hydroponics. I had a successful first crop, all out at market, and then it got wiped out by thrips, and I gave up. So this is exactly where right now there's enough documentation on aquaponics that it seems like the right time to really open source that because um, I think the key to that is going to be the integrated pest management, but we have a really good guy. But I think oh. when, when you can open source that and, yeah, and then have people actually learn the best practice and technique, they're just going to be blown away by what you can do in such a space. And that's our mm -hmm. intent to change people's hearts and minds about their own productive capacity. They, they're going to look at themselves differently when they see that, wow, I did this and it's so amazing. Uh, and now it's not it's going to be hard work and we have to get the system right. But yeah, it definitely lends itself to a collaborative uh, crowd-based process to, to get all the different techniques um, that are required. Yeah, definitely information-rich system. Yeah. What I really like about it is uh, once you've made your initial investment, the capital investment to build the thing and put it together, then uh, all of a sudden your operating costs are relatively low. And, yeah. um, well, that depends on how much energy you're using. But but the right. thing is it becomes a situation where with your labor and with your design or, or your, your management, um, mm -hmm. you can feed yourself and many others almost at no cost, yeah. which yeah. which is amazing yeah yeah i mean productivity should be really good and when once the system is set up it, it should be really an attractive proposition for many my goal personally is to 
that I'm not spending more than 15 minutes in there per day. And that's pretty mm-hmm. much to get a lot of my diet. It's basically, it's like, okay, things are growing. You, you pick some, you plant a few. It's like, you know, you throw a bunch of seeds, you know, 20 seeds back in the ground for what you took out. It takes you only a few minutes. And then it's about harvesting and managing. Them. But, but, but really the trick is going to be how the real ergonomics and how the details of it are set up so that it allows such an operation to happen. So that's going to be um, interesting. Keep optimizing. It'll be very exciting for people to see to see this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I missed uh, much of the conversation. I I had something else going on, but um, mm-hmm. it sounds like the documentation and the outreach and mm-hmm. I guess the first example um, greenhouse is is really the focus of of what you're doing and. Um, I'm I'm really interested to learn your process. I've I've kind of watched it, but I've never really understood. Uh, it seems somewhat yeah. complex, and and I'm right. not really a machinist type person, uh, but I definitely am into uh, plumbing, piping, and um, tanks and uh, hydroponics. So this should be pretty interesting. Okay. Definitely, definitely. I mean, we're trying to pretty much make our process more transparent. We're going to produce a few videos and explainers and um, to get people on board more quickly because we are trying to create a process that's really accessible to just about anybody because the whole development process has many, many different tasks. Just because somebody can't do the engineering, they, there's many other tasks to be done from communication to leadership to everything else. Yeah. Definitely. So we look forward to having you on the team next week. Uh, we're, we're also going to go at 1 p.m. for the aquaponics. We'll, we'll send out an announcement for the uh, for the aquaponics next session. In the meantime, if you, if you want to see more how we operate this Saturday, which is two days from now, we have two two design sprints. One is going to be on the continuing on the icons, and the second one is going to be continuing on the micro tractor. Some of the initial designs on that. So they're going to join us. You can look at the design sprints page on the wiki for that information. Um, and that's uh, Hangout, Google Hangout? Uh, that's going to be a Google Hangout, yes. So you can look at the wiki. Um, just type in design sprints in the search box. It will take you to that page um, on okay. the wiki. That would be good. So. Uh, was there another person that is piping through some comments in the background there? Anybody else? Or? Yeah, um, it's Andrew here. Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Can you hear mm-hmm. me? Yes, you're kind of very soft. Can you try to speak up? Yeah, sure. Uh, is that better? Yeah, speak up, man. Is this any better? Uh, hang on. <laughs> it's still pretty low, but scream. <laughs> How about now? Is that better? Yeah, now it is. Now it is. All right, All right, I'll go with this. Um, yeah, I just wanted to see if you've had a chance to look into Slack as a community uh, communication platform. Um, I really think it could solve a lot of problems with getting uh-huh. people uh, to work together to keep communication more mm-hmm. transparent and also mm-hmm. gamify it a little bit by making it just really rapid and easy um, it's got a lot of it's got a good API so it's possible to connect it into if this then that so you can uh, make mm-hmm. sure that you're logging all of your communication into a Google Drive somewhere um, so you don't you're you're not going to run the risk of losing any communication on there in the future if something happens to it um, but I think okay. that they're going to keep it quite open and the API is is uh, apparently quite good um, it's great mm-hmm. to be able to get people with different, it gives you different channels for communication on different topics. Um, we're using it at the startup incubator that I visit, and I really think that uh, if OSE were using it for communication on ideas, it gets people out of email and opens up, um, you know, wh- what's going on, probably opens you up to uh, accelerating development uh, and tapping into that parallelized human potential as mm. well. That sounds good. Is that the thing that you tried sharing with me? Uh, or yeah. 
I, that that was so slack, so slack. I just invited you into our open civilization group, just as an example. But we're not, you know, we're only three or four people at the moment. However, I think that um, I think that OSC would would benefit from using it as a as their collaboration slash forum tool. Um, yeah, to just to be able to get some get some uh, transparency for other people around the world on on. Yeah. How, is that Slack. How does that, yeah, Slack dot com. Um, well, how does that relate to forums? So, so I mean, when we talk about our platform, it's going to be a mashup of a lot of things. I mean, is that is, how does that relate to forums? Would that like supersede forums? Forum. Like, yes, would be the forum? A forum and a team is it fully communication. App. So, is it fully what? Uh, fully like uh, searchable, so you can find anything. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Fully searchable. Uh, it's, it's, it replaces forums, but it's also just team communication. So when you say having a hangout, you're, you we uh -huh. be having our our we could have our pad in, you know, the Slack uh, forum channel or Slack uh, sorry team uh, hangout channel, so that you know that all of those conversations we could be pasting links and stuff in there as well, much mm -hmm. like we do with hack with. Uh, the oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the the hack pad. The, the pad, yeah, hack pad. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so. Yeah, so potential to mentor. Yeah. Mm. Um, how, what's the revenue model? Is that free or? The revenue model is you basically you you pay for extra features like security and like some extra security and um, you know they char they charge for being able to keep every all the information posted but you can just use if this then that to log everything anyway if you're worried about losing information um, so but you know uh, which is the incubator I'm at they, they don't pay for it but we don't have any problems mm -hmm. with information loss or anything like that um, they're currently yeah. valued at 2.3 billion or something like that now and um, they've gotten to that they've gotten to that position by um, being very enabling with their features um, most of their users are free well they have a non-profit program as well well you, you don't yeah you don't oh okay I don't, I don't they know have, they have a that. slack for non-profit program so yeah okay that's cool mm -hmm. two Jonathan in there yeah yeah what do you think of Slack? Should be used that? I mean, it, it definitely has the, the potential there. I mean, I, again, we, we, we've approached it from a very a mashup standpoint. I mean, one of the major aspects of it is team development and being able to, you know, one, get people to participate on it. Uh, and definitely, it's a, good, it's a decent platform we've been looking into, uh, but not really experimented, you know, as much. And, and so it's great to hear that you're involved in a community that's actually doing it and getting some positive feedback. Uh, our, our, I think the biggest concern is, is scalability and uh, the usefulness in terms of that. I mean, like you said, there's a lot of plugins, there's a lot of features that uh, that are very, very good. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's it, it can be a definitely solve a lot of problems. But you know, main thing for us is documentation, which right now we're in the process of retooling for the long haul and so that's been quite a bit of work in the, in the behind the scenes uh, which even tonight we're having a little bit of a discussion that later on but um, definitely something we'd like to look into even more mm -hmm. and, and yeah. what do you mean correct about, me if um, I'm wrong but OSC is more than 100 members right oh, oh sorry OSC has more than 100 Contributors, is that correct? Uh, there's many contributors over the years. There's been hundreds. Right now, actively, I would say there's maybe like um, people who are like regularly, like every week or every day, is maybe like it depends what you mean by active. But I mean, I would say actively, there's like 20 people um, doing stuff just worldwide. There's probably like hundreds, or depends how you count it, or thousands, depending how you count it. So, I mean, as far as, you know, from from people who are full-time on it, it's not, I mean, I'm pretty much full-time on it. Um, 
and then everyone else is pretty much whatever the time that they can they can um, contribute to it. At present, we don't really have any employees on, in the organization. It's a, it's a volunteer organization. The the model we like for how this would work is the Linux Foundation model, where with about a six billion six million dollar budget, they leverage about a billion dollars worth of contributions yearly, and so, so for us, we're, we're trying to see how we can do a similar model. And the first thing is generating revenue that we can support people when, because we're seeing that, okay, so people come in and then they, they leave. And most people, it's because they have, have to make money and have, have a job, right? So, um, which leads us into, actually, I, I do have a question for you, Andrew. Um, mm. we, we talked about the open source 3D printer running workshops yep. and getting continuous revenue from that. How is that going for you? Yeah, good. I've just put up the website, um, opencivilization.org. Civilization, the way yeah. the English spell it. <laughs> um, so it's with an S, not yeah. an S. And uh, yeah, we're going to start with a, a first event, just a meetup uh, in about a month. And we'll be ramping up those events and discussions uh, towards yeah. courses in June, July. And yeah. in those courses, we are going to be putting together... We were originally settled on the Mendel 90, um, but now we're thinking of moving towards a modification of that, whereby we've got a frame that is CNC routed to... Um, well, it takes the advantages. It takes advantage of CNC routing frames so that it can be snap in place. So it means that yep. the frame is very rigid. Um, so yep. we're looking at a design that a friend of ours, Richard, who's quite an experienced machinist, has been in the industry for a yep. really long time. Uh, he's designed it and he wants to open source it. So we're probably going to move forward with that it could push back our timeline a bit because it means we're going to have to play with 3D printing parts uh, to fit that frame. But I think overall mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a better idea because it's going to end up being m more rigid and you're not going to have to worry about um, axes being, you know, not perpendicular and things like that. Um, Richard, yeah. is quite, Richard is really skilled. I saw him, I first met him and they, uh, it was kind of like a community meetup uh, for tech heads, and he created a triple, um, a triple material extruder using a single head. So he's got three mm -hmm. different types of plastic feeding into one head, and he was printing some very high quality results with it. Um, so you can, yeah. with, with, when nice. you've got a single head, if you do the calculations correctly, you don't have to worry about. Uh, having an extra head um, pushing rubbish all around. Um, yeah. yeah, he's definitely a top man for the job. And we've got our the person that will actually be running our course uh, primarily is Michael, who is also known as Trifford Hunter. And he uh, he pretty much wrote the manual on how to tune 3D printers for performance. Uh, he, if you look at Trifford Hunter's guide for... Um, Do you have a link you could uh, Yeah, I'm not, I'm not logged into, I'm not logged in um, to the hackpad. Um, okay. But if you just Google Trifford Hunter's RepRap calibration guide, what? Uh, What's it called? Google. Triple Hunters? What? Tr Trifford Hunter. T R I double F I D. Like Day of the Triffids. Like Day of the Triffids. Yep. Uh, Triffid Hunters? Rep wrap calibration. Yeah. Rep wrap calibration guide. Uh huh. And so that's by, that, as far as I know, is one of the most sought after guides for calibrating 3D printers. He really knows his stuff. I've seen is him. A guy with you in New Zealand the there? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? He's a guy from New Zealand by by where you are? Uh no trip no, um Michael Moon is uh from Byron Bay. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, yeah, just as a comment on on Andrew's work. So so Andrew, um, it appears that you're kind of following, I guess the worldwide. You're an effort where kind of like an OSC spinoff or collaborator who is uh, pretty much following the pretty rigorously the the workshop model or funding. So that's that's what you're looking at for funding the R and D at your place, pretty much by. Revenue from workshops. Yeah, that's it. And the way we are trying to scale and and be agile, lightweight in the beginning is we're just going to start with building uh, four printers and four students. But if people uh-huh. choose to buy more printers from the website, then we can scale our classes up accordingly. So that way we are able to. We're yeah, we're able to scale up to maybe 16 students in in total at the moment, but it lets us sort of grow slowly and generate okay. you know, discussion and talk without you know going all in on say buying 16 printers in bulk and then yeah, but, uh, having them. I mean, out if of you've that. got, but hold on a second there. If you're running a course, then people pay for the course, so you're not. Yeah. You don't have money out of pocket, so why would that work? Uh, uh, well, no. The the thing is, selling the course positions is a, re- a lot easier than selling the printers. I so see. If yeah. The printer, if the printers cost a thousand dollars, and you can sell them for, and, and you can sell them for two thousand, or if they, we're, we're really aiming for more like six or seven hundred dollars and selling them for sixteen hundred. Um, but you're the people attending the course are only paying say five hundred dollars each, and it's a three-day course. Then the three D printers are actually the item where you're making um, more money off, and it's not sustainable unless you're selling those because the five hundred dollar attendance doesn't pay for the materials. Mhm. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you have to. But for us, I mean, the way we're thinking about it oh, is... Oh, but hang on. Here's an idea. What if you, we could actually have them in teams? If you had two person, if you had two people per printer, that would yeah. balance that would balance things out a bit more nicely. Yeah. We could try that. Yeah, I mean, go through some... I mean, uh, I don't know if you're documenting any of that, but I mean, if you're thinking about it, document that for a review. What we know is we, we ran a workshop last year where we used the yep. Lulzbot kit test. 12 people showed up. Yep. We actually didn't want any more because we didn't think we could handle it, which I didn't think was a good idea myself, but I would have run it with more people. But but people build that over a weekend. They paid yep. they paid 600 bucks for the workshop and the kit itself was 1,000 bucks. So they ended up paying 1,600. Um, yep. I'd like to get the workshop fee down and um, so that it's not so much, and still try to make it work. It could work if you really, really have a solid build that's very, very efficient, and you really spend a lot of time you, I'm sorry. developing. If you really had a solid, a solid what? Uh, losing you. Hello? Yeah. So anyway, uh, I, I, yeah, I got, I got nothing there. I, I didn't catch any of that. It dropped out. Mm. Okay. No, I just, in summary, I said that we charge people 600 bucks for the course and people paid a thousand dollars for the 3D printer and they came out with a really nice 3D printer. I would make, I would yeah. prefer if I would to do it, uh, charge people about 300 bucks per person for the course and then whatever the material costs are, if possible. That's, yeah. that's what we're aiming what for. Are, what are, what I was thinking of doing is that we'd actually have our the printers that are in the course are sold separately, but the mm-hmm. when people come out of the course because they've got the skills, we give them the materials at cost so that they can then um, continue at home and and replicate what they've learned. So they are able to walk out with the materials at cost, but we end up with 3D printers that we can sell through the site because we want to put them through quality we want to put them through quality control 
measures that could take a bit more time. Um, but we think that that is that might be a more that might be a better way for us to go. Yeah. Yeah. I think the quality control process needs to be integral. Otherwise, you probably end up yeah. spending twice as much time as you need. That's it, that's it my suspicion. Yeah. Quality control is huge, and we've got the people that can handle that. Yeah. Um, what's yeah. another key factor here uh, that have popped up recently? Oh, I suppose I've really discussed everything. Um, I'd be really excited to see. The thing I'm really excited to see is um, OSC figure out the communication and yeah you know, I, I really feel like getting on slack or something like that is, is pretty important because really the only thing really connecting us is these conversations really um but the thing that's yeah. interesting yeah. i find about slack is when, with startino like where we're using it at this incubator is that when it's running when i'm not here i feel like i can see what's going on in the studio because everyone in the studio is using it and um, I can I can be anywhere in the world and really feel quite connected to the chatter that's happening here. Yeah. No, that's, I've never that seen sounds before. good. That sounds pretty interesting. Um, we'll have to look more into that. What where that fits? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Paul, I'm, I'm just a question. What what uh, yeah. 3D printer did you select? Uh, you're talking to me. Uh, I, yeah, for me. I was talking. Yeah, me? even even for for both of you, that's a, an open question. Yeah, for for OSC, the one we'd like to go with is the Troublemaker. It's an Ultimaker clone. That's open source. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you can look at look that up. You can probably Google that up. Uh, I really like the team that's developing that, and they're very good at documentation. So I like working with them. So we're currently planning that. The main reason being an enclosed platform without a moving bed. So in other words, the the X Y moves the, the bed moves up and down. The X Y is in the not on a bed. It's uh, basic. So we can print tall columnar shapes, which are the case for a lot of the tractor tubing that we like to print. So, like how how tall? Up to twelve inches. Oh okay. Oh you you know it's 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 quite interesting. I think with some some of the problems that you guys have had with beds, what we see from Richard and Michael's prints is they have they don't have any of these problems. I think that when the when, when your printers depends on I mean, depends way, how much you're putting. Yes, you can optimize, but you can optimize at the cost of something. So for the case of just a single line print that's like on the low quality settings, so you can do it really fast, you get into issues at a certain point. I mean, you can definitely optimize it, but at the cost of you have to actually print much more slowly, which means that our prototyping can be delayed in some cases. So. We'd like to avoid that from the get go. Rigidity, rigidity could be the issue, and also whether or not you've got it on a on a solid table is also an issue. Yeah. But yeah. but I've definitely seen like there's no limits to what these guys in terms of the height on their on their bed. Um, I think. Uh, I can give you a sample file and see if you can print it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I can give you a sample you a file, sample. and if you can show me a quality print at the top, I, that, that would actually be pretty good evidence. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I can send I'll, you that. I'll send, so. I'll send you a picture. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I am aware that it can be a problem uh, if, right. if you don't know what you're doing, but I'm, I think right. in the right hands, it's not, a, it's not an issue. Yeah. Um, Okay, did, did anyone not else not get a chance to speak? Because i got to get going here myself. Um, anybody else would like to ask anything? Jonathan, what are your thoughts? Oh, 
Um, I suppose I also would like an opportunity to talk about these few developers that I've met uh, and what okay. we'd like to rally them for. So okay. I've, I've got a develop, developer friend, David, in Melbourne who wants to dedicate six months of his time and live off his savings to developing something for open source. And we've also oh, yeah. got um, Tom and his brother Hamish who have had a lot of experience with um, creating diff- different businesses that earn them passive income. And mm-hmm. they also they hire um, developers in Europe to work for them as well. And they are mm. a hundred. They are fully on board with open source, and they really get it. And do they, they know Python? The first person I. Uh, yeah, I think they use Python. I use Python. Um, da- David. Um, David uses Python. Python's I can tell you about anything. something that would be really Python. valuable. Hmm. Work for free cat. I can tell you something. Something that will be extremely valuable is so we actually got uh, recently got in touch with a developer of motion simulation software, mo- motion simulation for CAD, and he's willing to open source that so we can put that into free CAD. Do you think maybe your friend okay. would like to do that? Um, it's so that that's using Python. Yeah. Because I'm because FreeCAD uses because Python. Python just is not Python is not a fast language to be doing simulation and three dimensional computation on. Like it is really oh, slow. Like, we're gonna have a religious war. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's not a religious uh, war. It's just, there's a reason. There's a reason why you have like you know. Oh well, if you've made the externals in C plus plus, then you're fine. But um, speed. I think that's the case. I think. A, well, because Python, the way people make modules in in a FreeCAD, uh, my understanding was that they do it in Python, but uh, it's actually fast because Python does only a, some of it. So, yeah, I'm not okay. sure. I, I don't understand the architecture enough it's to comment. Like, but it's more like a, Python's operating more as like the like an API, like a it's for execution. It's not all the. Well, not Maybe. all the three dimensional is that. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know enough cool. about FreeCAD. So like it doesn't Do you want to try to ask him about it? Uh, you want to talk to him about this particular project? Because, I mean, that's something that would be really. I mean, imagine, like, for example, if you we do the backhoe or just even the articulated tractor to understand the motion and the basically the articulated motions, mm. we can simulate all of that, how it reacts under forces and how it moves, and you can actually do animations with that. So yeah, it would be a very good contribution for the rest of the community. Could I get your details so that we can um, maybe have a more detailed chat later? Well, this is Marchin speaking, uh, but no, no, I meant the um, sorry, the name of the other developer that could work with us on this. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. This is uh, this one guy that. Yep, yep. That's I can send you uh, if you look up. FreeCAD with small f. It actually turns out that this guy, this is not FreeCAD with big f. Um, actually, it doesn't come up here. Let me um, go to my blog on the wiki. I documented, just just look at the conversation from like a few days ago. There's a guy on the open source kinematics. So you can okay. get a link to his website there. But that's the guy. Um, so he's willing to... Uh, basically, what we do is we ask different people to be advisors for the organization. This guy is willing to be an advisor on CAD for us, so yeah. so uh, cool. we can take advantage of that. Uh, he's willing. Okay. I talked to him about um, the open, helping us on the open source motion simulation, and he's he's interested yeah, in doing right. that. Okay, and if it turns out, see, my feeling is that these guys, they're more versed in app. UIs and web UIs mm-hmm. in 3D. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've I've developed things in 3D for 15 years, and I've I've been doing that stuff for a long time. But I'm not yeah. able. I don't have the time. I the time constraints for me. I just can't really um, spread myself any further. Uh, so at the mm-hmm. moment, I've got to say my feeling is I think that they're probably going to be best used for something in the uh, 2D web UI app UI realm, and what we have started 
to uh, figure is, is really important is um, are using the APIs that exist for the documentation platform, Suzuki, but opening that up as we discussed in our email much and like uh, being able to plug Suzuki into a Stack Exchange like platform as well um, mm -hmm. so that you've got them all in one place to crowdsource yeah. our problem solving and links to documentation. Um, and the most important part, I think, that is really missing that could be adopted uh, across a m much broader community of people is gamifying the production of real-time documentation uh, faster than the way the Dazuki uh, app really lets you. So really making it be very you don't even have to think mm -hmm. so that you're just taking a picture yep. with a hardware button on your phone and you're annotating yep. it with audio in real time as you're doing it so you can... Absolutely. Uh, you can tr turn that into well, text later, making that just rapid. Now, if you could do that, that would be great. Um, I'd love to see that. Uh, one one good feature would be that it's done doable offline, so that when you're not in an interneted totally. setting, yeah, it would still work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I'm all over that. Yeah. <laughs> no, really I mean that's if you can uh, develop that, you would be the first people to use that. Uh, we've talked yeah. about that. So the the people from Caruza, the the optical router link, the people with the CMC torch table, yeah. they're talking about a, the same concept: how to make the documentation just like that, just turnkey, real time, turnkey, real time documentation. That's much okay. much desired. Um, if you, yeah. I know they're not they're not going to work on that yet. They're going to do that maybe in a few months. But okay. that's well, um, we're, we we can probably start quite soon. So uh, yeah. if they end up yeah, going ahead, definitely need to connect. Yeah, it would be very very much uh, desirable. Mm -hmm. Great. So yeah, I think that that feels like it's much needed and could greatly accelerate oh, the amount of sharing that happens if people just mm -hmm. feel like they want to share and want to create that documentation, which they often don't. Because they have to type right. while they're taking pictures, well, right. that just doesn't make sense. Yep, just basically an automated process for that which a diligent documenter does in a really confused way. You know, <laughs> like you know what I do is like you know you take pictures in one platform, you you upload it elsewhere, you write some text to it, um, produce videos around it or whatever. I mean, you can integrate that whole process, pretty much streamline that whole process. It's just a simple thing like streamlining that whole process is going to do great wonders. And I'm wondering, I mean, who is the best person, who is the best effort that does it already? I mean, Dozuki yeah, does we, that, we, it, it, but... But we can use their API. A that's little, a beautiful thing. Right. They, so you're going to build off Dozuki on that? We, yeah, we can. We make that one component okay. because the, their API is quite powerful. We use their database. They've sorted out. They use the open document format, which is great. Right, no, but be careful. So here's one. Is. Here's one suggestion. The the Dozuki itself is not open source as software, so you'd have to probably no, write something. I understand on, that. On that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so we've so, identified where the limitations are around that. Like it means that yeah. we can be agile and fast in the beginning. Like uh, we can use the API as a database, uh, provided everything that we're doing is free. Um, the, it would mean that anyone else connecting to our platform has to, can't can't be profiting off it, or they just plug in their Dazuki login as part of the app. So that responsibility yeah. falls on them. We're just plugging in, plugging into their Dazuki account, and so that way we can just we can get the ball rolling quickly. But if we identify it as a limitation, we could then look it at is a limitation the Dazuki platform. If it becomes a real problem. And um, we 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 are uh, it's stopping us from being able right to do things yeah. that we need to. Yeah, I mean, uh, cool. I would say that we wouldn't be able to, do, as far as OSC perspective, we wouldn't be able to do that because it, from the long term perspective, that's not acceptable because it's it's got limitations on scaling it's or open access. Right? 
Well, I mean, just a simple thing yeah. is if Dozuki goes down, your platform is dead. You know, it's not scalable. It's not a long-term solution. No, it's not. But I mean, right now we're trying to design... They've up their free capabilities a bit re more recently. Um, they've gone down the sure. path of being a service provider. Um, it's really easy to have a free account with them now. So oh. it's, yeah. And the beautiful thing about using uh, their API is that we can replace those upload modules and slots and data with our own thing later in the future without that being a problem um, because it's all it's modular. So, right. Um, yeah, if you I, can, uh, I really like yeah. the idea of maximizing these guys' uh, use by plugging into APIs that already exist if they're available. Yeah. Most of them are. So we've got an open, there are open source variations of Stack Exchange 2, which we can plug into. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if, I mean, and then even just like for Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, if, if there's a, um, if you guys have experience on that, we'd definitely love to learn because we just want to basically implement Stack Exchange by embedding that in different places around our infrastructure, like a exactly. mashup, more mashup style until we get to know exactly. what exactly works, what's the final platform that we need to do. So basically experiment totally. with a lot so, of these things. You know, you, you could have your module in your app where you're building your documentation for, and that could reference a particular topic, or a, sorry, a particular uh, category. But then you could have the master location where everything is posted. If, people are just operating in a support capacity that can be at that one centralized location where they can view everything. Um, so, yeah, the embeddability is what we're looking at for sure. Right, yeah. Okay, but well, i got to get going, though, because we have another meeting coming up. So, yeah, yeah there's good discussions. We covered a lot of stuff. It's... Uh, uh, I'm posting, so this is this got all recorded, so we've got this for other people who have missed it. They can see this in the records. Um, and then, so I encourage all you guys to join us again next month uh, for these monthly meetings. So I'd like to close it off here, and thanks a lot for your contributions, and thanks for supporting us, and we will talk to you soon and keep building our team. So thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. See you. Okay. Good evening. And, and great job, uh, mm -hmm. so Thank you. Thank you. So, cutting the audio recording. <laughs>